The vessel is a mostly for me is a tool. It's a container for magical power and energy that helps build that magical pressure that can then be used to fuel our work. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to another edition of the Glitch Bottle Podcast, where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander F., and today we welcome back author, talismanic jeweler, and dirt sorcerer, Mr. Aiden Wachter. Listeners, this is the second part of a two-part conversation with Aiden, who shares about his latest book entitled Six Ways, Approaches and Entries for Practical Magic. He shares about how to defeat the self-hater in magical work, how to open portals to various layers of reality via ritual. He also delves into the difference between sigils and petitions, and he talks about the fluidity of magic versus the rigid expectations that some of us might have when working with spirits. Aiden also shares about how you do not have to work with every single spirit that you make contact with, and you need to evaluate things on a case-by-case basis. Aiden also answers your Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions, and he shares about his upcoming book and so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, we welcome back Mr. Aiden Wachter. Mr. Aiden Wachter, thank you so much again for coming on the Glitch Bottle Podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. We have so many amazing listener questions to get to. One of those questions is from Katie. And Katie is asking, Aiden, I love the part in your book where you discuss how to defeat the self-hater and the self-hater as a cultural artifact. Can you, Aiden, go into depth about the basic ways that listeners can begin to combat this? Sure. So the self-hater is something that I picked up from, I believe, Truth or Dare by Starhawk ages ago. And it's just brought up, I think, a couple of times in that book. But basically, it's the idea that there are parts of ourselves that do not wish for us to succeed. And when I was digging into this, as it's been a concept that I've used over year, over many years, and I think I was reading in a book or listening to a talk by Pema Chodron. It was a Tibetan Buddhist-related thing. Whoever it was that was talking was basically discussing how they had kind of gone back to their teacher who was Tibetan and was talking about this same kind of thing, this kind of, you know, negative self-identity that worked was, you know, really hard for people to deal with. And their teacher had never encountered it because he'd not really dealt with Westerners. And I realized at that point that this was really a kind of a cultural artifact, not a natural part of human nature or anything like that. And so for me, this is one of those things that's like a really kind of severe energy leak if you have it, because it's working at cross purposes with you. It basically means that there's a part of you that is always trying to tear you down, which is counter to what we're trying to do in magic, I would hope, which is, you know, build ourselves up and, and become more functional people. As far as basic ways to combat it, it's being aware of it, being aware that it isn't you. It's like a cultural construct. You could kind of view it as like a spirit in a way that has attached itself to you if you kind of dig in and realize that you have this thing going on. And so you can kind of treat it like uh, like that. You can process it as if it is uh, an entity more than if it's than a part of self. And so the basic things are, yeah, that it's not you. It's not even human normal. It's a totally cultural artifact. And that you decide how much weight you want to give it. And you get to decide whether it serves you or not. I believe it's an externally applied kind of control mechanism. My best guess is that it kind of came out of kind of the Protestantism, but I don't really know. And so first it helps if you can ask yourself if you support this thing's presence in your life, if you accept this set of controls that basically this thing is placing on you or not. And if you don't, then you can kind of go after it using magical means. This thing's nature is one of those things that is where I learned that you could go at things very laterally in magic. And I had a friend back in San Francisco when I was in my 20s that began having kind of really extreme violent impulses. And these were towards his friends and towards his girlfriend and things. He hadn't acted on them, but they were becoming harder and harder to control. We kind of did some work on him and determined that this was basically what this was. This was the part of him that really or an aspect that didn't 
want him to be happy. It didn't want him to have good relationships. It liked it better when he was a total mess. And so what I had him do was kind of begin noting things that felt the same, not that felt like the anger, but what kind of other experiences in his life felt similar. And these can be anything. In his case, it was food related, that he realized that he got a particular kind of craving for certain foods that felt related to this thing. And so we decided to see if they were indeed related and if we could use that as a lever. And so when he started getting urges for those food, which I recall as being chocolate and peanut butter together, we would kind of stop that right then. Like when he got that serious need for that thing, he would stop and go, okay, I believe that this is you, that this is this, this violence tendency, and I'm not down with that. So if you want this kind of food, you have to work with me, not against me. And it was kind of a long process, but he was able to successfully use that as a lever to control this thing. I would say view it more as a spirit rather than something that is really yours, and uh, you can go after it that way. Aiden, that touches on something that is related to this, which is there is this ritual that you came across that has to do with feeding your demons. And I, can you, Aiden, to that point, talk about the process you discovered and use called feeding your demons? And why is this process so important for people who genuinely want to clear out some of that gunk and, and really work? Yeah, totally. It's a process that I stumbled across kind of randomly. It's uh, derived from a Tibetan uh, Buddhist bond sorceress, Chadrai, and it was brought forward currently by a lama named Sultram Alion, and there's a book called Feeding Your Demons by Sultram Alion that describes the process. I believe there's an extensive YouTube video up by her now that you can also use if you want to learn it that way. And when I saw it, it just made sense to me because of the way that I work with kind of selves and spirits and spirits as selves and selves as spirits, however you want to kind of mix and match those things. And the process is a really cool one. And so the idea is, is that in this context, the demons are the things that are non-helpful parts of you, parts of you that are kind of uh, at war with your whatever else you're doing. So these could be tendencies towards violence or towards self-abuse or towards, you know, addiction, towards being mean, towards tearing yourself down, towards whatever, self-sabotage in all sorts of ways. And the process is a really cool one where you sit down on uh, to, to meditate, basically, but you do it with two cushions. And so you're sitting in front of another cushion so that if somebody were sitting on that cushion, you would be close together looking right at each other. And during the process, you switch seats quite a lot. You move between the two cushions. And so when you're on your cushion, basically, you identify one of these kind of problem areas and you kind of tap into what it feels like, what it might smell like, where you would locate it in the body, if you can feel it in the body, if it has a color, if it has a texture, you know, all of those kinds of sensory things. And once you have a solid sense of it, you switch seats so that you're now in the demon's seat is the idea here. And this is a very cool thing, because there's a way that you perceive it as external that gets hugely clarified when you're sitting in its seat experiencing this process as that demon or as that aspect of self. And you begin this kind of question and answer with the demon. And the process is really simple. From your seat, when you're sitting in your seat, you ask the demon what it wants. And then you switch seats and let the demon communicate what it wants. And sometimes they don't want to communicate. And so it's kind of an interesting process of being very patient and kind of uh, keeping a positive disposition towards this thing. And eventually they'll tell you what it is that they want. And then you switch seats again. You move back into your seat and you ask it, what do you need? Right. You switch seats again and let it tell you or you, you can tell what it, even if it doesn't really want to talk, you can tell what's up because you're in its seat. Right. And you find out what it needs. And then kind of the, the third step of this question and answer process is you go back to your seat and you ask it, how would you feel if you had what you need? And that feeling is the kind of key to the whole process. And so you go back to your seat 
and you basically kind of dissolve your entire being into uh, a nectar that the demon can feed on, and you flood the demon with this. And what you're flooding it with is the feeling it would get if it had what it needed. If anybody's dug into my work, you can see a lot of what I got from this as it relates more directly to sorcery rather than this practice. And as you flood this thing with this nectar of the feeling it would get if it had what it needed, in time it will either dissolve or dissipate or it will transform into uh, another form that sometimes you can then enter into a a relationship with that transformed form of the demon uh, as an ally and work with it in the future. It's just a huge, hugely amazing process for most of the people that I know that have done it. It's very involved time-wise. That's the main thing I would throw out. Don't think this is something you're going to do once or twice or even a dozen times and get the full results of it. I believe that the suggestion is that you do it you know, 50 to 70 times. I think I did it about 100 times the first time. So this was several months of work doing it uh, you know, pretty much daily. To that point, we have a follow-up question from Annalise Antoinette who's asking, Aside from feeding your demons, can you share, Aiden, if there are specific magical rituals that you do daily or weekly that you might have incorporated since the publication of Six Ways? Or if there are none, could you just share maybe what might be a moving or slightly paradigm-shifting magical technique that comes to mind when you think of a technique that somehow sparks awe or wonder? Sure. The short answer to that first question of what I do kind of regularly is is coming out in the next book and is too involved to go into here. But the one that I think is the most potent and probably had the biggest effect on me is actually up on the blog. And it's, I think, called There Are Doors. It's easy to explain. And so what it is, is you decide that you want to find a door or a gate. And the gate leads to another reality, however you want to view that. And you go preferably out into nature, though I've done this in parks and cities, and you go with the intention of finding a door, and you keep going, and you keep visiting places until you find one. And the tricky part is that you don't want to intellectually decide that something is a door. You want to see something and know that it's a door. And I believe that this is relevant. I believe there are particular kind of power spots and, and gateways between you know this world and other worlds. And so it's important that you actually find that thing. And this is all just feeling sense stuff. It's like you're going to know because it's going to be a little weird. It's going to seem a little bit sketchy when you continue with the process here. Uh, <laughs> if you've got a real door, if it all seems a little too easy, you're probably not at a real door. And... What you do is you don't go through the door the first time, but you begin to think about the fact that it's a door and that if you walk through it, you're going into another world and into another reality where everything will be different. And you think about how things would be different and how things would be better for you and how things would shift. And you let yourself be very aware that this is a one-way passage. You don't really get to come back to the world that you're in. And so it's a serious contemplation. And I recommend in the blog post, I think, nine visits before you decide to go through the door or not. Probably anything over five is fine, but nine is a power number for me. And you just keep revisiting and building up this sense of the reality of what's on the other side of that door. And Whatever that last visit is, is where you actually have to decide, do you go through it or do you not? And this is a real question. It's not it's not a given that you would go through the door. I've done this a few times, and every time has produced really extreme radical changes in my life. And it's always been beneficial to me, though it's not always been easy. That's probably the the most potent kind of thing that I can think of that relates to this, especially in the sense of sparking awe and wonder, and that I think people experiment with. Though, again, I don't necessarily suggest you go through that door, but the process is is hugely valuable, too, even when I've chosen not to go through the door. I really benefited from your analogy, for example, of the field and of magic as a ship, the field as the sea, 
And that really helped me when visualizing your exercises that you lay out in the book. Can you just kind of talk about why that analogy? Can you kind of walk listeners through that? It's just so beautiful. Yeah, and I'm just going to read it from the book because I know I couldn't do this from memory (laughs) nearly as well as I wrote it because it was kind of a, it was a pretty inspired section of the book, that little piece. It clarified a lot of what the book should be for me when I was writing it. It led to a lot of changes in the book. And so this is, you know, from chapter 30. It's the first maybe five paragraphs from chapter 30. As mentioned before, I like to think of our magic as a ship. The field is the sea, the currents, the winds, the sky, the stars, as well as all the birds, clouds, rain, and sea life. It is also at the deepest level the ship itself, as it is the root of everything perceivable and of ourselves. Over time, with consistent effort and clear focus, we build our ship plank by plank. We learn to read the patterns of the waves and currents, and we draw to us a trusted crew of friends and allies. The altar, which is any place where we gather to do our work, is like the wheel that steers the vessel, the rudder, the sails, the engine, as well as the instruments we use to navigate and adjust our course. We and our allied spirits man the sails, and when needed, the oars. Divination, visions, and dreams are like the sailor up in the crow's nest with a spyglass, keeping an eye out for obstacles and land, divining by the flight of birds, the songs of the sirens, and the witch lights that shine deep in the waters at night. The offerings, candles, incense, sigils, and spells are both fuel and another type of general steering. The point of all that imagery is that we should view what we do as a whole. We may well do discrete bits of work, but we must understand that we are a vessel with a purpose, a crew, and a need of maintenance and care. In most cases, we will be the most effective and powerful when all aspects of our work function synergistically towards our goal. To continue that analogy, I'm wondering, Aiden, what part of the analogy would something like sigils be in? You you mentioned in the book, and I'd love for you to talk about sigils because... You mentioned sigils are coding information into a dense packet that can be gently slipped into our deep mind. Can you elaborate on this, especially in light of this beautiful nautical imagery in terms of how should people approach sigils, what are sigils, and how can they be used for the maximum magical benefit? The kind of ship analogy with the field is realizing that all the work that we do is pointed in some direction, right? And I think, to me, I I used to do a lot of work that I realized after a while was kind of working at cross-purposes, right? They weren't mutually supportive, to put it in a kind of different sense. It's like my work itself wasn't producing kind of symbiotic relationships between the different kinds of work that I was doing. So it might be doing work for, you know, financial betterment and particular kinds of relationships, but they weren't coherent overall. They were kind of looking for different things. They were kind of like, it was like I was asking for different lives all at the same time. And so a lot of the work that, I guess the point where things began to work much better for me was when I began really looking at things and all the magic that I did and all the mundane stuff that I did as being one unit, right? So that's kind of the overview And a lot of this comes from kind of the ideas that, to me, became evident from doing just tons of sigil magic. The idea is that with sigils, if we look at Spare and mainly Jan Fries, who wrote a fantastic book called Visual Magic, is that we're taking a statement of intent. We're taking a a statement of the thing that we want or the thing that we want to be or the thing that we want to experience, and then we're turning it into an image And the process is really simple, and there's tons of information out on there, but I'll give you kind of the short form for anybody that doesn't want to go looking. So if we say, I enjoy and and enriched by all the work that I do, there's a bunch of little keys in that one, right? It's saying how it feels. It's saying what you get from it. It's saying that it happened already. You're not asking for it to happen. You're describing how you feel once it's happened. This alone is a really useful tool. This is kind of Claude Hopper version of this is kind of what you see in kind of affirmation stuff in the New Age and New Thought movements, which have a place, but they're not the one that I use. I don't use them like they're like they're intended. And so we take that 
statement and we write it out and we cross out all the duplicate letters. And then we copy the remaining letters, however many there are, onto another sheet of paper is how I do it. Throw away the first one. You don't really want to keep the exact wording in your mind. Even if you know what the thing is, you don't want to really be able to replicate it. And with those remaining letters, you begin to combine them into a little piece of art, into a little glyph. And that's your sigil. And you can make it as complicated or as simple as possible. So a lot of, if you have a ton of letters, you might knock out all the vowels to shorten the, the string of letters. There's really not a lot of rules here. And then once you have that image, that's what you work with magically. You don't work with what it's for. You treat it as if it's a completely, just its own little being is how I think of it. So now I've got this symbol, it's pretty, or it's hideous. If you use Gordon White's term, the suggestion to make it hideous, make it so it looks magical to you, embellish it to whatever degree you want to. And then you treat that thing as that's the spirit that you're trying to work with. That's the spirit that you're trying to empower. And you can work with it directly. You can use it you know, in candle magic. You can you kind of feed it and make offerings to it. A lot of people, most people, I think, get great success just by um, creating them and taking the time to create them and really get into it and enjoy the process a ton. And that's actually often enough to get them to manifest. But everybody's different, so some people do a lot of do a lot of other stuff. But you don't have to do it, it's not a hard process, and that you don't have to blast energy into it, which is kind of how it was described in chaos magic terms in the early days. Both Spare and Freeze talk about it that by doing this process of turning this statement into art and not really knowing exactly what it was for or forcing yourself to forget it if you're Spare, but I don't recommend that approach, you bypass all of the reasons why you can't have that thing or why you can't experience, experience that thing. The conscious mind doesn't really get to get involved directly. And if it comes up, right, it pops up and you're working on this thing and, and some part of you pops up and says, well, that's stupid. You can't have that. You go, what are you talking about? It's just a little picture. I'm just talking to my little picture. What do you, I, it's, it's nothing. So what's there to have or not have, right? And I think that if we can kind of practice this a lot, because that's the main key to sigil magic is doing a lot of it, it shows you a lot of how kind of, again, we work with that ship. Like, do we want to send those packets of information into ourselves and into the ether and into wherever sigils go to become whatever they become? Again, they should kind of work together. They should be synergistic. They should be at least friendly to one another, right? So I know people who couldn't figure out why their lives went to shit when they went into, like, years of kind of battle magic. <laughs> And from this perspective, it's really obvious, right? You're feeding all of this stuff in with a particular kind of level of aggression. But you're also trying to do your love magic. You're trying to have a good job, but things tend to get wonky. And so that's really what the ship is talking about and all of these things are talking about is can we get ourselves so everything is pointed in the same direction uh, so that we're not working at cross purposes with ourselves. Aiden, to that point, you also delineate in six ways in your book the difference between a sigil versus a petition. I know you've touched on both in the past, but just to kind of make the distinction, when typically would someone use a petition versus engaging with a sigilistic operation? I mean, really the answer to that is that they're very similar, except that a petition, I learned it from Hoodoo, but a petition isn't trying to do that bypassing. It's not, you're very conscious of what a petition is for. And for those, I know that your folks tend to be more on the ceremonial stand end of things. And a lot of you will know this, but a petition is a really simple thing to do. And the way that I was taught it is that you cut out a square piece of paper. It's usually not huge. And you write out whatever it is that you want. And this can be that you want a job, that you want money, that you want protection from an archangel. It doesn't matter whatever that sentence is, right? That's your statement is that you're asking for this thing. And you uh, start on one you know, with one edge is the top of the paper. You write repeatingly that statement, that desire all the way down the page. And then you rotate the page a quarter turn and start again. So you're writing over the top of what you've written. And you do this until you've written over the thing four times, right? You've come down from every from every edge. 
And then traditionally, you sign it the same way. You write your name over and over and over again over it. Or if you're doing the work for someone, you write their name over and over and over for it. If you're involving a spirit or an archangel, you would write the archangel's name or a call to them over and over the same process, you know, rotating the paper. So you end up with this like squiggle mess. So there's a way that it's like sigils and that you can't really see the whole thing, but you know what they are in a way that if you're doing sigil magic the way that I do, you really don't know what the individual sigils for. And then you can burn candles on them. You can put them in vessels. You can put them in charm bags. It's just a really simple, low-tech kind of no experience required to have good success method. Sigils are a little bit more work, but I find that they work a little bit better, and they work better for stranger things. (laughs) You know, as you mentioned, many of the listeners are familiar, Aiden, with ceremonial magic, grimoire traditionalism, and I think this next question from Annalise Antoinette kind of hits on that a little bit, which she's asking, it seems from a reader's perspective that Aiden, your chaos magic background has gifted you a take what works and leave the rest practicality. Annalise is asking, have there been times that spirits or the field have given a clear message that a particular aspect of ceremony or pomp and circumstance was in fact needed when perhaps you had considered it superfluous? Or have you instead found the coding, for lack of a better term, for accessing specific spirits or others within the field to be more malleable or changeable or forgiving even than aspects of ceremonial magic might lead us to believe? My experience is that overall, it's way more fluid than people think, but not always. There are some things that really do want to be worked or are only willing to work in very specific ways, and I've encountered some of them. But that's uh, kind of a rarity. I have found that with a lot of deities and a lot of named spirits, but I don't tend to work with a lot of deities or named spirits. Uh, but even within that, I've had contacts with things that have got a, that are come from a tradition that has a really set way that you work with them, where they've shown up and kind of said, well, this is how you work with me. And I have said, I don't do that. But this is how I do things. Is that interesting to you or not? You know, we don't have to be doing this together. But if this is interesting to you to work in this way, then I'm, you know, I'm open to working with them. But yeah, sometimes they say no. They're like, I want this. This is my fumigation. This is the sigil you use. This is the process. This is what I get fed. This is the kind of agreement you have to have with me. This is kind of common with some of the more uh, present and really alive deities that I've encountered. That they're like, no, you kind of get to join my cult or we don't play. And I'm generally like, well, we don't play because I'm not doing that. It's not interesting to me and I don't need it. But overall, I find it really fluid. And it's pretty interesting. And I think you can play in there a lot. So even if you've got a deity, you know, there's some things that are pretty clear. Like there are deities that do not like alcohol around. And there are some deities that do not like blood around. But in a lot of cases, if you kind of hit something and go, okay, what I'm interested in giving you is fruit and uh, a donut when I'm by the bakery or I'll buy a beer for you. I don't offer alcohol because I don't drink. And everybody kind of, that was a transition for a lot of my spirits. And a couple dropped off because they really like the alcohol and I don't give it to them anymore. But everybody else adapted. And in general, I think that I always kind of go here and and when I talk about this stuff and I never mean it negatively. So I have to kind of put out the caveat that this isn't a negative statement. But most traditions, and this is all human traditions, this is not about magic, in some degree are methods of control. The idea is there a way to perpetuate a system as it is. The question to me that's interesting is, do the spirits really care about that side of it? And some do, some don't. And actually, to that point, Aiden, you've mentioned before, and in six ways, that, for instance, when it comes to astrology, Aiden, you've mentioned that you don't pay much attention to it specifically, but you pay a significant amount of intention to the moon, and you give the moon and the lunarium an incredible amount of attention. Can you share why there's this emphasis on the lunarium and and the moon phases versus zodiacal considerations overall? Yeah. I mean, most of it has to do initially with complexity, and that I'm not a fan of complexity where it's not actually needed. So to me, that means is, do I have to bring a particular kind of complexity into my practice and into my life, or do I not to get what I want out of it, right? So this is an entirely personal 
choice. I'm very aware that the astrological stuff is relevant, and I do follow a couple of people that I get some astro info from. And I've had beautiful work done by astrologers to kind of explain things that are going on in my life as far as large cycles. But as far as me doing stuff that way day to day, it's just not going to happen. Whereas the moon, I'm totally and have always been kind of madly in love with and totally affected by. It's just undeniable. I get a massive power boost for the two weeks where the moon is the biggest in the sky and I kind of tank at the new moon. And this is an interesting thing in that it seems to mostly matter what the moon was doing when you were born for most people, from what I understand, from some of the astrology folks that I know. So like my wife is inverted. She gets super into the new moon time, and that's when I'm kind of useless. So we both annoy the hell out of each other at the full and new moon because one person's like ready to go uh, <laughs> and wants to talk about everything nonstop, and the other person's like, I just need to chill out and watch some Netflix. <laughs> uh, you know, to me, the moon is just so present because we're such water based beings that those tides do their thing to us, whether we like it or not. The big planets, they're doing it, but it's a little more subtle. You can kind of ignore it most of the time, in my experience. <laughs> Aiden, in the previous podcast, you mentioned that you know there's a, a really specific kind of line that you come from. This was when we were talking about ritual offerings and offering to the dead and, and whatnot. And I remember you mentioning that you can trace your family line, for instance, back to the to the Mayflower, for example, or, or very close to that time. There might be some distant relatives who might look at what you do or what some of the listeners do with ceremonial magic or dirt sorcery or sorcery and say, well, magic is selling your soul to the devil. Um, can you just kind of, it sounds very rudimentary, but can you kind of dispel the idea of selling your soul and can you talk about an excellent point you make, which is that spirits like humans are open to enticement and persuasion for the forming of agreements and pacts. Sure. So I think we talked about this before, but, you know, I'm deep into kind of word roots when playing with magic in that I want to see what things are. <laughs> Where did they come from? Because I think things get um, added or lost in translation a lot and things move into common usage that don't mean what they meant. Right. But a pact is an agreement. And so, you know, if you want to make an agreement with the devil, that's totally fine. But it doesn't sound as cool, right? <laughs> and then when I was contemplating this question, uh, a couple of my allies came in, and, and this is what I'm supposed to say about this, which is that I have it on good faith that you can't actually sell your soul anyway. And so you shouldn't do it, as it's a bit like writing bad checks. It's also probably not what's messing up your life. If you think maybe you did this when you were 12 and listening to Ozzy, it's interesting. It's all about relationships. Some relationships are very deep, which are like old friends, which is what I think of as, as the allies. The allies that I have mostly seem like they've probably known me before and that we've worked together before and that they're connected to me. And whether that's a deep family line thing or whether that's more of a spirit, spirits recognizing spirits. And then some are like hiring people, right? So we might need a plumber. And we don't really have to have as deep of a relationship with the plumber. We can actually contact the plumber and say, hey, I need a water heater installed. What's that going to cost me? And they can say, well, it's going to cost you 500 bucks plus the water heater. And you can say yes or no, right? And so both of these kinds of transactions are, I think, very common. But not everybody works the way that the other one does. So some only want that transaction. They want something in specific. And that's the only way that they will do work for you is you give me this thing, you pay me this much more or less, and I'll do that thing. Whereas some won't do that at all. They just don't care. Like, you want to buy my time? Not interested. You know, but if you've built up a long-term relationship through things like offerings, you end up with something that's much more like close friends that, sure, your friends, you call them up and go, we're moving. I have beer. Bring your truck. And some of your friends will say yes. I don't see this as being hugely different. And so, yeah, it's again, you can make the agreements, but the agreements are just for work done. And yeah, again, the, my allies are pretty straight up. that There's not anything you get to sell. So <laughs> they think that's a funny idea. 
just as you mentioned, saying, you know, I'm, I'm entering into a consensual agreement with the devil doesn't just sound as, as cool as a pact. It's not as you know, cool. Selling my soul. And again, and again, it's that whole idea, right? It's like we look at a lot of folklore, and a lot of folklore is anti-magic, right? A lot of folklore is telling you that you do not ever want to do these things. And so the question to me is, do you think that that was written by a magician? Or do you think that was written by someone who didn't think that magic is a good idea, right? Are they trying to sanitize it? Are they trying to accurately reflect it? You know, what's really going on? Right, and it's pretty crazy because it's like, we, and we even get that in kind of like, you know, what we think of as kind of Grimm's fairy tales, right? There's a lot of talk, and this is true both in the Bible and it's in Little Red Riding Hood, that you stay on the straight and narrow path, right? Because otherwise it goes bad and you get fucked up. Well... But what if that's not what you're looking for? What if you're not looking for things to be quite that straight and narrow and quite that safe? What if you are interested in getting your hands a little dirty? Does it make sense then to stay on the path? Or do you want to go and maybe see if you can seek out some of those wolves and uh, come to an agreement? I think that's a very good question, and I hope the listeners can can answer that one for themselves as well. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to answer that one for yourself, for sure. <laughs> Eight and two, what I love about Six Ways is you dedicate each chapter, I think of it as just a different flavor or a different color in this very kind of just multifaceted rainbow. And one of them is you dedicate a chapter about vessels, which really change the way I consider what a vessel is and why it is so important. So can you share with listeners who might not be too familiar, what is a vessel and and what should they really take away from that? Right. So a vessel is like anything that is a container, right? So a box can be a vessel. A charm bag can be a vessel. There's a lot of non-modern magic and some modern magic that involved things being done in jars and in bottles and in urns and in gourds. And the way that I think about vessels is a bit like how I think about magic circles and ceremonial magic, that sometimes the magic circle is to protect the operator who's inside of it from the things that are outside. And this is kind of what we generally think of. We see the the illustration of the magician with his wand or his sword or whatever inside the circle, and he's then conjuring things into a triangle or something, right? But there's other approaches to this, and there's some schools of witchcraft that view that the circle exists to protect kind of the people outside of it from the work that's happening inside, And so it's not a defense for you, it's a defense for everyone else, right? And then there's another witchcraft-based approach, which is where I tend to dive in on the vessel thing, which says that the circle is to contain power until it can build up enough to be directed to where you want it to go, right? And so the way that I think about this is pretty much exactly as a steam engine, right? And so a steam engine is a basically a a big boiler that you apply heat to and then you let it out once it's built up a lot of pressure and it begins to move things like trains so really big things (laughs) there's a lot of power available and it's only available because of that pressure buildup. and so the vessel is a is mostly for me is a tool it's a container for magical power and energy that helps build that magical pressure that can then be used to fuel our work And I do a lot of vessel stuff work. You know, I've done vessel magic where I've worked with a particular vessel for many years. And if I know I'm going to do that, I actually tend to make the vessel myself out of clay. But uh, you don't have to. It's just that's just kind of personal, personal thing. And they also keep things in that containment sense from getting really messy. And they allow us to kind of get things where we want them before they're kind of just thrown out into the world. And the analogy that I do use on that one is it's we get a different effect from putting all of the ingredients for a meal, say a pot of chili or something, in into a pot and adding the water and adding the spices and then cooking this over a long period of time. This is a very different effect than if we just threw all those things into a fire or just dumped it on the floor. And the interesting thing to me, or most interesting thing, which is a repeating thing in six ways, and all, I talk about it so much, I often feel like I'm just kind of flogging the dead horse, but if you do vessels for long-term work, they're going to develop towards or attract a spirit 
of some sort. And so I think it's really helpful to think of them as tending towards becoming a creature of some sort. So if you think steam engines and creature, it should kind of get you where I'm going with vessels. This actually intimately ties in in six ways with vessels, with kind of these dense packets of information regarding the sigilistic engagements you write about. But you're also a talismanic master jeweler, and I think that many listeners might have a specific idea, Aiden, of like what a talisman is, especially if they're familiar with, you know, empowering talismans based on the phases of the moon and specific metals. Can you elaborate on, on what you mean when you say, quote, a talisman as the root level type of material base for the work of magic? It can be a vessel, a creature, a storehouse, a key, a gate. Can you elaborate? What is a talisman? Right. So, Talisman is a very similar concept to the term fetish, not in the I like latex and feathers kind of thing, but uh, magical fetish. It's something that contains power or that power indwells in. And there's a really great book that you can get on JSTOR by Dorji Bonzarov, which was written in the 1800s, I believe. And Dorji Bonzarov was a Mongolian anthropologist how I read his book, it's called The Black Faith, is that he's kind of just so fed up with the Western take on what's going on in Mongolian shamanism because they just can't get the basic points right. <laughs> so uh, what he's kind of saying in one part of that is he's saying, uh, you know, these anthropologists come in and then they talk about the Black Faith as being incredibly primitive because they worship rocks, right, and stones and trees, and what Dorji is saying is they don't actually worship the stones and the rocks and the trees, that they're in a relationship with the spirits that indwell those things. So to me, that's what a talisman is, is we're trying to create something that a power or a spirit or an energetic frequency can indwell in and then can be used in some way. So it's holding that power. There's natural ones, like hagstones, right? Hagstones are very traditional in a lot of witchcraft as being powerful talismans, natural talismans. And so this is a stone that has a hole worn in it naturally. And so we can find a hagstone, right? But not all of them are really live in the same way, but some of them are really live. They've got something indwelling in them. And so that's kind of what we're looking for is trying to get to that, again, as you said, it's that creature sense. Can we, and this is going to be different if you're doing like a straight up, you know, talisman from Barrett or something like that. This is not what they're trying to do. This is certainly what I'm trying to do. And so mostly it's, it's like a physical manifestation of a magical process or effect or spirit. And so we're looking for that sense of aliveness. But even if we don't get to that really creature state, and that may not even be the desire, we want to like create something that can hold that power, like a spell or a working, so that when you need, say, protection, and you have a talisman that you've worked with the archangels or whoever you work at with for that kind of thing, consistently putting the, that energy, like a really simple one is if you're going to do a calling to the archangels in the quarters for protection, every time you do that, basically consciously try and place that power into the talisman. And one of the ways that I also like doing this is try placing it somewhere in your body. Tattoos are very helpful for this because you can always touch the same point on them. And so in that way, you can kind of have that connection to that working that you've done quite possibly many, many times available when you maybe don't have time to do that working. You can simply touch that talisman or wear that talisman or touch that point on the body and trigger that effect, right? They can be keys or gates if they're created to help you move into other spaces. So same kind of idea. I'll do trance work into particular spaces in the other world. I will create a talisman for that location so that I'll use that when I go there. And over time, it makes the process of going there easier and it makes interaction there easier. It makes me, I think, more perceptible and more coherent and more tangible to the things that I interact with there. You 
warn against the pitfalls of delusion in the book, Aiden, and how can the clarity of the talismanic arts help us apprehend things as they are and refocus our energies, kind of take that proverbial sword and talismanically kind of cut through delusion? How can, how can talismanic arts help address delusion? This is not like a high-level you know, Buddhist take on delusion or something, but delusion is thinking something is one way when it isn't when it's actually not that way, when it's some other way. And the common ones are that we think we are a failure, or we think we are weak, or we think we don't deserve to have a good life. Or we, on the other side of that, we think we're just incredibly awesome. We think that we're like, you know, the hybrid of Beyonce and Johnny Depp and The Rock or something, and that therefore we can do no wrong. Both of these things are probably wrong, And if we think those things about ourselves, it really messes us up, right? Because if we think that we're kind of born to lose total failure, too weak to make a change and stick with it, we're never going to really be able to bring our personal power to bear on the things that we want to do. It's just, it's self-defeating, right? And then on the other side of that is if we think that we're just totally the shit, we're never going to learn anything because we don't think there's anything to learn. We already know. We're already awesome. And unless you're somehow correct, then you don't have the information that you need to proceed in your life or in magic. And again, this ties into that kind of bow and arrow kind of trajectory concept, right? If we don't know who we are, we don't know what to change or what change we want to get where we want to be or to have the kind of life that we want. And the spirits in particular, they know who we are. Because they're not, they don't care about this whole surface persona, right? I think a lot of people leave magic because of this, because they get kind of torn up. Something just is like, oh, yeah, you think that? But I think that's a bunch of shit. And I think you should get your shit together or I'm not going to talk to you, because I don't believe that your word is worth anything. The talismanic arts are really interesting because they're, to me, they're like a, there's a kind of purity of intention to them if we're really trying to do them the way that I'm talking about it, where we're really trying to kind of have them be a a really incredibly clear and focused manifestation of some particular thing. And what I think we can learn from that is, can we do that to ourselves as well? Is there a way that we can treat ourselves as the talismanic object and feed ourselves accurate, supportive, strong, focused information on what our reality is, where we're going, what we're trying to do. And this can allow us to kind of do massive troubleshooting and really get clear about what we already have, what we want or don't want, like all the things that people think they want that they don't want. There's a lot that we want maybe because we live in America and we're told we're supposed to have it. There's a lot of things people want that their parents really want or that their lover really wants that aren't important to them. And to me, you wouldn't do that with your spirit work. You wouldn't do that with your talismanic work. You would want to be totally clear. And that's, I think, how that can help. We have a listener question from Cash Aiden who's asking, I'd actually like to hear a personal example of one of Aiden's own practical results. And obviously, you've already shared a few in this podcast, but is there anything specifically to Cash's question that might come to mind in terms of sharing practical results? (laughs) Yeah. So about two weeks ago, we decided that we needed uh, a car that actually had four-wheel drive because we live in the mountains and it snows. And I don't know if Cash has bought a new car, but I find the experience incredibly unpleasant. Because it seems like you never get what it seems like you should get. You never know if they're being really upfront with you, honest with you. You don't know if they're actually giving you the best price they can. The trade-in thing is always really sketchy, right? It's just, and it always takes like forever. So the morning that we went to go do this, we knew what car we wanted. We knew what it should cost us. And I went in to, I came in here to the shop and created it charm bag and talk to my spirits and said, look, I want this to go really well. I want us to get a fair deal for our car that we're trading in. I don't want to pay more than we should. And I want it to be really stress-free. How that worked out is we were in and out within three and a half hours. We got $2,000 knocked off of the MSRP on the car, and we got $3,000 above the highest blue book for the car that we were trading in. 
why we don't really know, but it was fine with us. So theoretically, that was like a $5,000 kickback on a couple hours work, which is really, of course, decades of work. But uh, that's a, a major one. There you go, Cash. The next time you're buying a car, if you are buying another car down the road or buying a car, just remember that as well. That is so cool. <laughs> Aiden, to that point, in terms of practicality and in terms of results, we have another listener question from Meredith Graves, and she is asking, what advice do you have for witches trying to write books for other witches or to assist sorceress types? And I know that you definitely have some great thoughts on this in terms of, you know, knowing your audience and and who you're writing to. Hi, Meredith Graves. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is really straightforward. And it's know that people and particularly magical people are incredibly fucking smart. And so if you keep that in mind when you're writing, I think that that is crucial because I think so much stuff is dumbed down and it, there's no need for it. Um, at the same time, you know, it's like we've got way too much stuff that is like needlessly arcane and needlessly obscure and there are people that that is what they want to read, and there's people that that is what they want to write. So this is not telling you that if that's what you're into and that's who your audience is, that you shouldn't do that. But to me, it's like, can you be kind of honest and straightforward and make it as useful as possible and really kind of go, okay, what's the most useful thing I could share <laughs> with really smart people? That's what I you know, hope that I'm able to do to whatever degree of success I actually get. Aiden, both in the last podcast and in this part two chat, you've given us a little bit of hints here and there about this next book you're working on. And I know Annalise Antoinette is asking, I'm sure it's on many people's minds, in what time frame can we expect your next book to be published? And, and can you give us any, any more hints in that direction? Sure. The target is first quarter of 2020. I'm deep in revisions. I'm hoping by Christmas to be able to get that out to advanced readers so I can get their feedback and see what massive gaps I have left, because I probably have, and we'll see. But that is the target. So first quarter, it's called The Blessed Hell Ride, and it is a deep dive into my kind of primary working approaches which is a journaled form of hypersigil. And for those that don't know what hypersigils are, they're like a long form narrative form of magic. They're a written form or a, some people have more drawing or painting skills than I do and do them that way. And they can also do them as like a kind of a fictional story, uh, though I don't use that approach. And that combines with a method for kind of daydreaming, imaginal time traveling to uh, support that. The third major piece is something that I learned from this group of Neanderthal hunters that I deal with in the other world and call the brothers that they taught me that is a a way of going and hunting down points of uh, damage or trauma in our past and transmuting that into kind of usable fuel. And then I'm also working on a book after that, which is a book on sigil magic as I do it. Well, I know we'll definitely look forward to keeping our ear to the ground on that and hopefully having you on. would love to have you back on to discuss all of those workings. And Aiden, can you let the listeners know where they can find you online to check out your excellent talismanic jewelry, to check out your book, to get your book, Six Ways, and also if they'd like to reach out and, and connect? Certainly. I'm on all social media. Well, no, that's not true. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on the new social media. I'm on the... Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you search Aiden Wachter Talismanic Jeweler, everything comes up. My website is AidenWachter.com, and that's got my blog. It's got a page for six ways that it has links out to you know uh, online sources you can get it uh, most of the world. Yeah, I'm uh, Aiden at AidenWachter.com for anyone that wants to drop me a line. Primarily, most of the magical discussion I do happens on Facebook in the Six Ways Facebook group, which has got close to 2,000 people in it now and is a very nice contained 
non-spammy, non-trolly space for folks who are interested in work that's kind of related to what I do. It's not a wide open magical space, but in that we don't really, we're not going to digress super hard into something like Goesha because it's not the main focus. But as far as general practices that are kind of uh, functional, functional work that can be used in multiple systems, multiple traditions, multiple religious backgrounds, I'm pretty open to most of that stuff. Talismanic jeweler, dirt sorcerer, overall badass, Mr. Aiden Wachter. Thank you so much just for taking the time and <laughs> stopping by again on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's super fun. Listeners, there are so many things, but one of the awesome things that strikes me about Aiden Wachter, and I've heard this from a few Glitch Bottle patrons as well, is how he focuses on reclaiming our autonomy, how we need to effectively treat ourselves as talismanic objects in order to harness the appropriate focus to have internal troubleshooting and to go further down the path. And for ceremonial magicians like myself, I'm very used to the idea that when it comes to practical magical engagements in a specific grimoire ceremony, ceremonial magical context, that's not typically used for improving spirituality. And again, I'm talking about pursuing specific physical and material goals here. But what Aiden reminds us is that every practical operation, every grimoire execution of specific ceremonial results also has a profound effect upon the operator, and that there are rituals and practices that Aiden shares which are vital to anchoring the consciousness of the operator in reality and the multiple layers of reality, so that there is a clear, stable engagement with spirits inside the circle as well. Also, Aiden's approach to working with vessels, sigil creation, and the rituals of vision and opening the doors to different layers of reality are profoundly powerful. And I found these powerful, especially for some of us who are not naturally gifted scryers or who don't naturally possess the innate vision needed to engage with spirits. Plus, reason number 5,673 that Aiden is an awesome guy he also re-recorded part of the podcast with me after my software for the first time ever decided to randomly freeze up. So I hope you check out Aiden's book, Six Ways. It's awesome. I cannot wait as well for his upcoming work. And as always, thanks goes to our amazing guests and each and every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon, where patrons can definitely enjoy exclusive perks and benefits. But most importantly, your support is so, so appreciated. You help keep the lights on and you are the sole esoteric fuel taking Glitch Bottle into new and interesting territory. And you can always check out Glitch Bottle on patreon.com slash glitch bottle and subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker.com and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander F reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon and keep the light. Keep the light.